Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Stop LAPD Spine Coalition's third Tuesday of the month uh, community meeting. This is our general meeting, and my name is Hamid Khan. I go by he, him. Uh, and today, but we're super excited uh, to have uh, a bunch of our comrades, uh, revolutionaries, and then, you know, freedom fighters who we're going to be talking to and celebrating Black August. Uh, just continuing on the, the legacy of uh, ancestral resistance and also looking at where we are today. We talk about building on the shoulders of our ancestors, but how are we building? Uh, where are we at? What is, uh, how are we building community? How are we building that cultural resistance? And how are we uh, moving uh, through this journey as ancestors as well? So super happy to be in this conversation. We're expecting Chairman Fred to be joining us. Uh, we also have General Dogon, a uh, human rights organizer in Skid Row. And we also have Natalie from No Name Book Club. Uh, but more than a panel, we just wanna make this also a conversation as well. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to uh, my comrade Matios, who's gonna be facilitating most of the evening. On to you, brother. Thanks, Hamid. Hey, folks. Uh, like Hamid said, my name is Matthias. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, and I'm a community organizer with the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition. Uh, and yeah, so we're continuing our celebration of Black August. Uh, last week during our War on Youth webinar, uh, we were joined by Harold Welton, a former SNEC organizer and Southern California chapter uh, Black Panther member. And Harold gave us some background on Black August and spoke about the history of both Black August and Black organizing and resistance here in LA. Uh, the theme for today's general meeting is continuing the legacy of ancestral resistance. Um, so it really is an intergenerational conversation. How, how have we been continuing that fight? Like Hamid is saying, what can we learn from our ancestors uh, and how has the fight changed in a lot of ways? Uh, and so I'm just gonna do a, a preliminary introduction of the folks we have today. Uh, First off, I'd, I'd like to name General Dogon, who's on the call, uh, who's an incredible uh, civil rights organizer from uh, the Los Angeles Community Action Network, has done a great deal of work in Skid Row, and I'm sure is familiar to most of the people on this webinar. Uh, and we're also joined by Natalie from the No Name Book Club, um, who's done a great deal of work uh, with incarcerated folks and um, political prisoners. And uh, we're grateful to have you here, Natalie. Uh, and I wanna hand it off to um, to our friends to introduce themselves. Um, maybe General Dogon can start. Uh, but yeah, if you could talk about who you are, say a little bit about yourself, but also um, just what is the significance of Black August to you uh, personally? So I'm going to hand that to you, General Dogon. Revolutionary greetings, everybody. I'm here on Spear Road. Uh, got to do the meeting outside. Uh, yeah, so thank you for that intro. Thank you, uh, Stop the Peaks Coalition, for the invite. Uh, I'm a fight back organizer on Skid Row. I'm born and raised on Skid Row. My parents met here in the 50s. Uh, been born here, living here ever since. Uh, so Black August. Uh, so Black August is real dear to me. Uh, I would most definitely say I, I credit uh, Black August, particularly the Black Gorilla family, which I'm a current member of, uh, for for my educational transformation, you know, and it, it, uh, the, me growing up, you know, uh, uh, going through the public school system, you know, uh, going to mentors, nobody could answer none of the questions that I had. I didn't get none of those questions answered until I went to a level five institution, the whole, and ran into them gorillas. And so uh, I talk more about that, but um, so in order to really understand um, Black August, you know, and the significance and how it started, and, and and why we consider Black August the real Black History Month, we got to step a, a step back in history and go to February. Um, February, you know, you look at February. February is a month that has the lowest days in it, right? Why? Because the last the, the two emperors, Julius Caesar and his brother uh, Augustine both took a day out of February to put in, eight, to, to put in July and August, which is the, 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 the birth month that they named after. And so February became the shortest month out of all of us. 
the, all of the 12 uh, uh, months. And so when Americans, when it was time to give, to recognize African-Americans in this country, right, uh, they decided to give us a month, but guess what month they gave us? Exactly, they gave us February, one with the lowest months and the lowest days. I mean, the lowest days in it, right? And so, um, um, so when you look at February, uh, February is, is, is more of a capitalistic month, right? Black people don't recognize um, um, February real, real, as, a, as a real Black History Month because there's no real significant incident that happened spiritually, culturally, during a revolutionary in February. Of course, Black folks did shit in every month. I don't play credit for it. But the spiritual, cultural line didn't happen until August. Right. On the other hand, when you look at Black August, the reason why come we call it Black August because it has been the month uh, that has been declared by our ancestors. Right. The month uh, of the dragon. That's what we call it in the BGF. Uh, August is the month of the dragon. It's the revolutionary month. Right. Uh, George Jackson started that saying. He said, "When the prison gates open up, the dragon will fly out." Right. And so the dragon is the revolution. Right. And so when you look at August, starting way back in the 1700s, right, we see uh, historical events that happen. Our spiritual ancestors, you know, made connections with the folks on the ground. Right. When you, you read the history of Nat Turner, he said August is when the stars align themselves with him and they spoke to him and told him this is the month. Right. That's when he started his resurrection in Southampton, Virginia, 1700s. You look at Harry, go move all the way, eight, all the way to 1800s. Right, Harry Tugman started the Underground Railroad Movement in August. Right, uh, you move up to the 19th century. Right, the uh, the, the the rebellion, the watch rebellions and stuff, all happening in uh, the month of August. You know, it's all the way up to now. You see uh, incidents and, and people rising up in the month of August. Right. You know, I encourage people to do your history. Right. And just research black history um, events. And you will see that there's hell of a things that happen in the month of August that blacks is giving credit for. And that's the reason why we 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 we, we celebrate Black August. But Black August is also a month that's dedicated to uh, George Lester Jackson. Right. It was it was it was George Jackson who was a prisoner in San Quentin. Right, who was going against the fascist state? He was murdered in San Quentin Yard uh, 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 by the pigs, and in his honor, we created uh, the Black Panther Party. Uh, George was a, a, a field marshal for the Black Panther Party at the time. Right, uh, he was also one of the original Solid Ad brothers. Right, and so when you when you do the history of George Jackson, right, uh, you will see. That uh, um, uh, uh, from 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 uh, 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 from his uh, uh, from his murder, right, uh, it came up like a lot of uh, history uh, uh, for his rebellions and actions in the month of August. People start celebrating August, right? Um, the month of August, just like I've said, is considered to be the month of the dragon. Um, in in the black in the black gorilla family, um, the first day of August, you know. Uh, was was real uh, discipline for us. Uh, we had to be up before the crack of dawn, right? And that means we had to be up our, and our mattress all rolled up, right? We had to be in Usalama's position. That means security in Swahili. And so every day was something different. We couldn't listen to the radio during the day daytime unless it was a, a educational program. Couldn't watch TV. Couldn't play dominoes, checkers, none of that stuff. Uh, the first day on the yard was a unity spread. Uh, all the members of the party, along with brothers on the yard, right? We gave a big spread. Everybody got to bring something. I don't care if it ain't number one top ramen. You got to find it and bring something to the table. And we had a big unity spread on the first day. We talked about Black history. We talked about the fight. Talked about the revolution, right? And every day, it was was, was a different thing. The next day, we studied military tactics. The next day, we studied medicine. The next day, we studied hand-to-hand -hand combat. The next day, we studied uh, history, right? Next day, we, we exercise on the yard all day. Every day was different, all during the month of August. We couldn't smoke cigarettes during the daytime, couldn't get high in the daytime, couldn't eat in the daytime. You had to let your stomach burn, right? We drunk water in the daytime and exercise, 
And so it was real strict discipline, right? And it carries over to the streets right now. You have a lot of uh, revolutionary and vanguards parties right now, right? Um, that still take this motto. And then um, every day we had to say our oath. We wake up in the morning, we have an oath that we say. And, and we, and, and, and then the, the, the guerrilla family, I became educational coordinator for black guerrilla family. So my job when the bus, the, the fish bus would pull up on the yard, my, my job was to all the brothers, the black folks, when they would get off the bus, my job was to introduce you uh, uh, to myself, put you under my wing, and indoctrinate you into black power and nationalism. Same thing, people seen the movie Malcolm X, same thing. You know, we tell folks, you know, they gotta be deprogrammed and then reprogrammed because you edu you educated by the state, the the the, the ununified public school district, and you got problems. You, know, you need to be deprogrammed. And so um every month was conditioning. We encourage people to get involved in the fight. If you're not involved in an organization, join one or start doing revolutionary activities for the month of August. You know, it was a month to learn about yourself, learn about nature. Right, learn about your brothers and your sisters. Right, it was a month to share, and it was also a month to fight back. And so I'm gonna stop right there. Right, uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, General Dogan. We're hoping to uh, so, hear more in just a second, but before we get to that, uh, I want to give Natalie, uh, a good friend of the coalition uh, from the No Name Book Club, a chance to introduce yourself, Natalie, and maybe talk about the significance of Black August to you, how it influences the work that the No Name Book Club does. Yeah, um, thanks for having us. And also thank you, General Dogon, for bringing up so many parts of like Black August traditions that really need to be remembered and upheld. Um, I think Black August for us, I mean, we, we do a book club, right? This is what we do. We read, we also send books to folks who are in prison. Um, prison abolition is central to, um, you know, we're not going to the prisons and tearing them down just yet. But in the meantime, we're gonna we're gonna read about it. We're gonna support our our um, families, uh, loved ones, et cetera, who are incarcerated or affected by the system. And uh, one of the major take one of the major ways that we celebrate Black August here is through study. One of the you know the many different roles being study, fast, train, and fight. Right. So. Um, you can be armed with uh, whatever you need, but books is definitely what you can find yourself armed with at No Name Book Club um, and the book club headquarters. So um, yeah, we just, we wanted to really up, um, uplift the legacy of Martin Sostre this year, who uh, was not just a incredible jailhouse lawyer and was incarcerated in Attica and several other maximum security prisons. Um, also had this really radical, amazing bookstore in Buffalo. It's called the Afro Asian Bookstore, and maybe folks have heard Buffalo in the news lately through the Tops um, supermarket um, white supremacist attack. But it is a very largely working class Black community that, till this day, is is in need of um, of spaces to really radicalize and to really have um, to study, to train, to do all the things that you need to do. So we really want to uplift Martin Sostre as we think about abolitionist pedagogy quite a lot here and try to root a lot of the work we do um, from that lens. And uh, yeah, Martin Sostre is an amazing organizer and radical. He is also the mentor to Lorenzo Kimbo Irvin, who recently reread his book. It's called Anarchism and the Black Revolution. Um, and it's just like the model and tradition of each one teach one and popular education to remove some of the hierarchies and be able to talk collectively and communally. Um, yeah, that's that's it for me. And thank you so much again for having me here. Cool. Don't go anywhere, Natalie. I feel like we're going to have some more questions for you in a second. Um, but before we go back to General Dogon, I want to see if there were um, any questions in the chat or if folks had any comments about anything that was said. And if you do at any point, feel free to raise your hand or even just drop it in the chat. Um, just hearing what both General Dogon and Natalie uh, you know, both of you guys kind of describing how uh, Black August affected you. Study and education was a word that came recurring. I'm specifically thinking about how General Dogon discussed how uh, within the LA uh, ununified school system, as he calls it, that uh, there was no one that could answer his questions. And, um, you know, that to me sounds like a lack of erasure. And I think it's, it's really beautiful how within Black August, um, we kind of created that, that system of education 
and informing and research um, and in, informed our identities in a lot of ways. Uh, and I guess my question is for you, General Dogon, in what other ways um, do you see Black autonomy, Black self-sufficiency being developed within Black August historically? And um, how do you see that happening today? So I still see the culture being kept alive. You know, so one of our symbols is doing Black August is to dress Black. You know, we always start off in the, with gorillas every day. We wear the Black handkerchiefs, right? That's our motto. But uh, just to dress Black, you know, bring out the culture. Right, so culture and arts tell a whole other different story. So most definitely, uh, we've been used to tell our story, you know, in drawings and stuff like that. You know, uh, we've been used to uh, tell our stories in songs and poetry and stuff like that. A lot of brothers I know got some powerful poetry, man. You gotta, you gotta listen to the black, some of the black August poetry, man. And then you got some that's real deep, that's that's on Egyptian mythology. A lot of Egyptian mythology is thrown around. In, uh, in the month of August and stuff like that as well. So people, you know, go to the stars and shit, you know, they get real deep, or, you know, our brothers be going, they go to the missing temple. And so, I mean, the little think tanks, the circles that, that that's, that's given in the parks, on the yards, right? When we sit down and talk, you know, the, the sharing of food, breaking bread and stuff like that. So, you know, those are other ways, you know, I would most definitely have to add culture though. Culture is one of the biggest ones. Especially when you look at our coach, how our black race has been um, attacked by culture uh, after the COINTEL program destroyed the Black Panther Party. You, you know, before they did that, you walk through the black community, you walk into a store, you see people wearing daishiki, you see the natural, you see you know, all the, the, the natural fart comb, you, you walk into the record shop, you know what I mean? You've seen the red, black, and green symbolized all over the place. But since the little 70s uh, black exploitation movies that Hollywood put on, they destroyed our culture, right? And so we went through decades and shit without culture. So now it's coming back. You know, I like what some of the culture is being put down at Lamert Park, you know, during the month of Black August and stuff like that. They be having events as well and around the city. You know, city, you have people having Black August events. We're going to have one at our office this Friday as well at uh, 5 o'clock. You know what I'm saying? So folks want to be down and come get involved with that as well. So keeping the culture alive, you know what I'm saying? And keeping the resistance, you know what I'm saying, and pump it up. So I'm going to stop there. Yeah, thank you, General Dogon. I, I know one of the things Pete always talks about uh, in the Kerner Commission in response to the Watts uprisings is how they identified a feeling of culture and self worth among Black youth as being one of the catalysts for, um, you know, resistance and so um i i think um i think that culture is an important co component of resistance that la can really embodies through the arts and culture spaces um natalie i don't know if you wanted to add uh anyways that the book club is kind of a hub for uh, a cultural space i feel like you all fill that role in some capacity sure yeah um yeah so just to take a quick step back, so um, for folks who are not familiar, the No Name Book Club is a national book club that has chapters in major cities and also in um, prisons, jails, federal facilities, et cetera, where we have our incarcerated book club members that receive books as well. So a lot of, um, so a lot of it is about reading, right? And this is also where we pack the books. Um, so when we have, well, just to, sorry, I'm making no sense right now, but the No Name Book Club is, is the book club situation. We have the headquarters, which is where we pack the books, where we plan the events, where we plan, um, where we coordinate the letters and the com communication with some of our folks inside. And also because it's a beautiful space, um, we have a community library and we host a lot of free events. So maybe you all who um, are on this call have seen that Stop LAPD Spying has been here to do trainings and uh, workshops and teach-ins, which is wonderful. That's the plan. So it's, a, it's education, but we also do things that are fun. Like I know people don't always associate us with fun, but we have open mics, right? Like um, culture work is so important, right? Like you can't just be fighting all day long and not have that moment to at least uh, engage in like beautiful, like poetry, music, et cetera, um, in community. So we do things outside of just reading. Um, not everyone has the, the the capacity, the time, the limitations, et cetera, to read. So you can come to the uh, book club headquarters and come to like open mics. We try as much as possible to read poetry from, from some of our folks inside as well, trying to lessen that distance between um, 
prisons and uh, outside spaces. So, you know, the, the aim of prisons is also to just to disappear people. So just as much as we could remove that, um, as much as we could uplift these, these folks who are um, equally parts of our community as they should be everyone's communities. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much, uh, that's it for me. I don't wanna go on too much. Just, you can come here for other stuff, not just, not just barring books, there's other events as well. Yeah, they've got a great calendar, uh, No Name Book Club. And I want to get to the topic of censorship and the materials that you send forward and how that relates to uh, erasure. But before I do that, um, I want to introduce uh, Chairman Fred Hampton Jr., who just hopped into the call. And, you know, the conversation is about ancestral resistance, intergenerational fighting. Uh, so we're so lucky to have the son of a famed revolutionary Fred Hampton, who's a powerful revolutionary and organizer in his own right formerly incarcerated political prisoner, the chairman of the Black Panther Party Cubs and the Prisoners of Conscious uh, Committee. Uh, chairman Fred, if, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself, appreciate it. Oh, you're muted, Chairman. Okay, right on. I say forgive, uh, free, them all, free them all power to the people. Um, Give me some critical for getting in late. Forgive me, my voice is kind of going on, so moving non stop meetings back to back all day. But, um, I'm honored and humbled to be on here. Just actually, just dealing with some situations. Um, literally, as we speak, um, infamous Cook County Jail, which happens to be the largest county jail in the country, I just got word of another uh, death in the county jail. I believe it, Dion Lee, um. And this is right on the hills. We just dealt with a situation a few days ago out to Reek Pleasant um, in Santa Cruz County Jail. And they both, um, both cases, um, the state is saying something to the fact that, you know, that um, it's not used to a typical run around, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, not, you know the, the euphemisms is in power, not responsive, or what have you. So we, um, uh, been, been, been dealing with this like intensity for the last few, last, last few days. Uh, also, just um, on the heels of uh, like Cook County Jail, and also when the coronavirus, when the pandemic was first being, you know, uh, this, um, cut, it was first being, you know, discussed. Cook County Jail was described as one of the hot spots um, for the for the coronavirus, and one of the major cases we had to deal with was the case of Nicholas Lee, um, his, uh, which is his being wife now widow. She was detail, you know, giving receiving details, you know, um, blow by blow what was occurring. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know um, inmates literally dying right there in front of him. He he, had, he he subsequently was the third person that we get get word that um, uh, uh, the, the state for lack of better uh, lack, 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 lack of better terms took out. So that's that's some of the things we've been dealing with. You know, as we speak, we also gearing up for the upcoming Chairman Fred annual Chairman Fred's free party. Um, it's a revolutionary flip on the phenomenon of a block party. It's August 30th coming up. And we're going to have a, a number of different fa uh, families who uh, children have been victim of, victims of police terrorism, making that correlation from, you know, uh, again, as, uh, as, as um, Minister U.E.P. Newton has said, the prison is a microcosm of the outside community. So making that, that correlation from the police terrorism that we subjected to uh, an outside community to what's happening you know, behind the walls. We see blatant contradiction, you know, saying well, even in the face with you know, it's, 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 it's openly acknowledged that um, the body cams, you know, you know say, uh, um, this, this, um, the, the pigs had their cameras on and many people are under pressure that, that, that will somehow, you know, stop these contradictions, you know, so, uh, but the deal is, it, you know, we, we, we get recognized, just, we have to heighten the contradiction. This, this is the police, the protocol of police terrorism, how they operate. Um, you, you, even before the body cams, you can look back at situ the TV shows like Cops, you know what I'm saying, and, and just see the, the arrogance you know, and, uh, how they move and how they operate. And some people have done the impression that, you know, that it's just, it's just because it's, because people say seeing it now that it's a, some sort of new phenomenon. But again, we look at the birth, the inception of the police. Um, which, which initial, initial duty was to capture those who ran away from the plantation, and some like even the contradictions of prison. You know, like, you know, say, I, I tell you, you even, even in our African history in particular, that's, that's a foreign concept. Even even have a discussion about locking people up, as there's even no, no African term for that. You know, and so so we just get continue to heighten these contradictions. In fact, we just speak about uh, Cook County Jail, which is on 2600 South California. 
on 20, I think 2300 South, uh, South California, 2300 Southwest, about, about four or five blocks from the county jail, is the uh, Humane Pet Society, the, uh, the pet care where we, we drop, drop animals off. And if the, amount of, the, the, the number of deaths that, you know, saying that occurring in Cook County Jail, just in this past week alone, if it was to happen at the Humane Society, there'll be an uproar, you know, a, 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 a international uproar about you know, what's, going, what's going on inside here. So you know, we, we, just, we just get a hold of the line, you know what I'm saying, to be very clear you know, what the purpose, the, the purpose of prisons is, the purpose of the police is, you know what I'm saying, and hold fast to the clarion call, you know, free them all. Cases of, you know, of the Mumia Abu Jamal, Dr. Matulis Shakur, Imam Jamil Alameen, your brother, the sister down the street, the people in general. I know some people have an issue with that term, we say free them all, but we say, you know, uh, uh, I think the, Mar the Marines say, kill them all, let God sort them out. The Black Panther Party cause, opposition is to be, uh, free them all, let the people sort them out. You know what I'm saying? So what you know what I'm saying? The Black Panther Party said that differences amongst the people are reconcilable. How the difference between people in the state are irreconcilable. Free them all. Thank you so much, Chairman Fred. Uh, and thank you for joining us in the midst of all this work that you're doing. Uh, it sounds like an incredibly busy uh, taxing day. And um, I'm glad you could uh, make whatever time you could uh, for us. Before you hopped on, um, we were kind of talking about education and study and General Dogon specifically was talking about how growing up, he didn't have the answers to the questions he wanted to see represented within the LA Unified School District and um, kind of how in a very autonomous way, Black August was a space for that, for, for that education study and history that you're kind of describing right now. Um, and first I'd like to open it up to General Dogon to see if you had any remarks on anything uh, Chairman Fred just said, but in addition to that, I was wondering, uh, Chairman Fred, if you wanted to talk about uh, the importance of Black August for you specifically in the work that you do. And also, we talked a lot about how this is just a continuation of that same thing we've been fighting, but maybe how has resistance changed um, that you've seen? But for General Dogon, I don't know if you want to add on to any. So. Are you asking me something else, uh, Montez? I just wanted to see if you wanted to add on to anything the chairman said, but chairman, I'll, I'll take it to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we got to understand too, I mean, the, the police and history in this country, you know, and, and we got to understand how they started off as slave catchers, right? And I mean, they still got the same tools, the same shit. They even they they, they still even got the dog, all right, to chase people to hell, right? Mm -hmm. And and when they pull you over to stop and frisk, same thing they did in the slave. They did the slave. They they pulled him over. They asked him for his papers, right? They ran his name for a warrant, warrant check, right? The same shit they do today when they pull you over and ask you for your ID. You know what I'm saying? You got to give them your ID, right? And then, I mean. Already, we already know they lead to the Klan. When you understand that every time, understand a little bit about white supremacy, understand every time that, that we want some type of, uh, of court court rights, civil rights in this country, to spark the, the rise of a Ku Klux Klan, right? Uh, every time, read history, every fucking time, right? And it's always the police that was, that was leading that charge, the mayor and everybody else, right? And, and it goes all the way to today, right? And what we see them doing today. You know, we see Chief Gates, you know what I'm saying? Um, uh, they, 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 SWAT, SWAT was created right here in Los Angeles, right? For who? For black folks, right? The ghetto bird, the helicopter, that motherfucker was non existent in other parts of the, of the fucking America. He brought that shit here and started that shit right here, right? And then look at all the, the, the equipment that they got, you know what I'm mean? All the, uh, I mean, look at Central Division, the right here on Skid Row is the most powerful it's LAPD division they got. Why? They don't even house prisoners there because of all the weapons and shit they got in there. They got SWAT, they got everything in there. They got the, the little robot to pick up the bomb. They got every fucking thing in there, right? And so, well, who's this shit for though? They want, they want to uh, make you and I believe, you know, that it's for Al Qaeda or the Taliban and shit like that, right? 
But every time we see shit happen in our community, we see these same equipment and all this shit being played out and rolled out in our community, right? But yet people still don't get it, right? So, I mean, that's why understanding Stop the Pigs Coalition, you know, uh, your stance against this, you know, uh, educating folks to uh, to the spying and what's going on in our community. Because this shit been going on since slave catchers, man. They just getting more sophisticated with it. And we sitting back with all this shit that happened. The focus, I'm gonna say this and shut the hell up. The focus right now is on homeless people, right? Because you only got a certain group of people street watch folks like us that do work around homeless issues that's really supporting and fighting back. Everybody else, you know, they don't give a damn what they do with the homeless people. So all the little street laws and all the little take them away your rights to be in public space and all that shit is being implemented right now. But it's to, you, to, to the people, it, you make it seem like it's directed at homeless people. But let me see, if you look at the way the, written, the art is written, that shit is written for everybody. You know what I mean? Because you believe once they get a hold of this holding Christ and get them on the wrapped up in these motherfucking cages and shit, like these care court shit they're trying to build and shit, right? Guess who they coming for next? Guess who they coming for next? Angela Davis told you about that. What she say about, you know what I'm saying? They came for us to do the daytime, at night they coming for your ass. All right, let me stop there. Right on. Thank you, General Delron. You know, most definitely all that you talking about. Yes. Thank you, General Durgan. And uh, General Durgan brought up, you know, the equipment housed in uh, Central Division. And I know Chairman Fred, you talked about body worn video at the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition. We obviously don't see reforms like that as a solution, if anything. Uh, we kind of seen here in LA how they've used that body worn video to craft their own narratives, to uh, facilitate more uh, racial violence, to codify it, to make it a procedure in a lot of ways. And I guess that that's kind of leading to the question of um, Chairman Fred, you know, through these technologies, we've kind of seen state violence change and evolve. In what ways have, have you noticed state violence changing? You've been a, a target for, uh, you know, a political target for your entire life. Um, in what ways have you seen state terror change and in what ways have you seen resistance uh, change? You know, you know, um, I'll, I'll, go, I'll do the latter. Uh, let me just say right, right on to the Updates and um, information, General Dog on, uh, uh, you know, talk about you know uh, in LA in particular. Um, let me start with the latter part too, with the resistance. You know, there, there, there's a, um, I know there's a narrative. A lot of times there's there is no resistance, but the reality is that <clears throat> um, resistance is happening. It's not just you know it's definitely not the stage we wanted to be. Because Minister UEP Newton that said a revolutionary is never satisfied, but uh, we, we we can't. Um, never uh, yield to the, to the narrative just because we don't know about it. You know, the, the, uh, you know the, uh, the resistance that's not happening because I like even it's an old tactic like when they train the elephant when they train the elephant in India, they said you train the elephant if the trainer if the if the uh, uh, elephant steps on a cup or a cup or something and the trainer steps on the cup. That particular elephant has to be destroyed or transferred because it can become contagious. The other elephants say, wait a minute, you know, how is this, you, you, you know, put in context the size of the elephant, how is this trainer, you know, uh, uh, controlling us like this? So even resistance, like, it's, it's, it's not by coincidence or happenstance that uh, when you're under attack, when you're under attack, to this amount of communication, you know what I'm saying, to stop, you know, so, that, so people can't, they even similar to doing the era of chattel slavery. You know what I'm saying when the uprisings was happening, you know what I'm saying, you know, saying in certain parts of the South, they said, make sure, make, make sure the other, make sure the other slaves don't get worried about these uprisings that happen. So I just want to say that the resistance is definitely is happening, but it's not to the point that we want it to be. Um, and also the, the, uh, the axiom that uh, Malcolm X has said that you know the collective consciousness of the people ticks slowly, but it erodes the volcanic force to make Mount St. Helen look like nothing. Um, the former part, you know, uh, this, uh, this reiterates the touch with uh, you're talking about the, 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 um, um, the different advances, even with technology. You know, just had this, I uh, just had this annual Bud, Bud Billiken parade in Chicago, which is supposed to be known as, supposed to be billed as the largest black parade in the country. And, um, we, you know, we, we came, uh, we, uh, it's the first time, first time ever that there was an actual float that actually uh, talked about, you know, the situation of the prisons. And uh, I'm saying uh, official flow, because, you know, we, we've come in on a number of occasions 
you know, we just, you know, moves we do, put, you, know, you know, putting information out there. But uh, Cassandra Greer, the, the, the widow of Nicholas Lee, I mean, uh, she, the flow actually had the um, names of those in isolations. I had, you know, had the, um, the, the, uh, had the sheriff of Cook County, Tom Dark, had his name on the list, you know. So this is the, uh, however, it did not go, um, it was it was it was an easy it was an easy fight it was an easy uh, uh, move either like even during the parade just you know different that the county insurgency was there you had like you know uh, different uh, even though they, they have different like parade numbers who were supposed to come in what particular time is so Negroes were popping up they were coming in they were sidetracking they were bringing other state officials in you know saying the circumvent cut off. You know what I'm saying? Uh, with, with the, the break, uh, the margin, uh, the whole, the whole, whole list flow back so people can see it. The, uh, everything is political. Music. There was, there was a lot of contradiction with even the particular DJ. The songs that they were playing. You know, you know see, he, he refused to play certain, you know, uh, music um, from the Judas and the uh, Black Messiah soundtrack. And this is, it was terrible, but it's fine because it's like, a lot of times our people. Look at struggle and look at attacks and the reactionary assessment. You know, say look at people about you know this this um, kind of like that, that old movie Police Academy when they got when the pig comes and say what the guns with the guns. A lot of people have an elementary assessment of what we're dealing with. You know, and in fact, I just come up a phone me a few minutes ago where I'm struggling about the political dynamics. So even the chairman for his street party. Some people say, well, it's just it's, 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 it's just do a street party. Let's get a DJ. Let's get a but the dynamics of everything being political. The, 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 again, is the DJ, what music he played. They refused, he, the, 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 uh, this famous DJ in Chicago, he couldn't, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't play some of the songs from the uh, uh, Judas and Black Messiah soundtrack, but he would, uh, they would grab um, uh, this, uh, this young cat, NBA young boy, Future, you know what I'm saying? They would drop him these proper, they were playing that. Would, these, these are, these are, before I say that, one of the disadvantages that we have, in our, you know what I'm saying, our, uh, I'm talking the black community in particular, there's a non-acknowledged war. That's one of the disadvantages that we have. And in other words, other communities have the advantage, I'm gonna say advantage and disadvantage, of an acknowledged war. In other words, you know, see the, 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 the term of political prisons, acknowledgement of political prisons, acknowledgement of propaganda bombs. In, in Nazi Germany, it's acknowledged that the SS and SA created the ghettos. The script has been flipped to our, our community say that somehow we created the ghettos. You know, so we just think it's just music. You know, these are propaganda bombs. You, you go, it's a, it's a, it's a white, white dude, a white pastor named Pastor Mike. He has his YouTube uh, channel. We, he literally says the words to the lyrics of the songs. You know, what I'm saying, and, 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 and people say, "Damn, I can't believe they're playing this." This, you know, what I'm saying, this is, you know, what I'm saying the details. You know, what I'm saying the type of video games. These are war tactics. You know, what I'm saying that, that, that are happening. But again, it's a non-acknowledged war, so it's going down. And then they don't, after the Bud Billigan parade, one of our comrades, our deputy field marshal was giving some trumped up cases with pigs that dumped on him. They gave, they gave, him, gave him a case. And it was revealed that the police had laid out the technology they had. They said, when, they said, Chairman Fred, what block I came into the parade? Who was with me? How I moved? All this came out, also revealed later on. But to the naked eye, some people thought it was just a parade. It's political. It's political. And we have to be able to pick up second nature, like doing, not wait till February comes around or Black History Month or election time to be uh, to be moving on a pivot. You know what I'm saying? Every dynamic. We, uh, we, uh, at the Hampton House right now, the house that Chairman Fred grew up in, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's uh, uh, constant tactics, you know what I'm saying? Code enforcement, you know what I'm saying? Different tactics. These are war tactics. And it cannot be, not, cannot be minimizing anything else. So we have to be, you know what I'm saying, recognize again. That even though there has a low, that, that may be case where people have, uh, 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 don't have the ability to sum up, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the, the, uh, the, the political nature, the political dynamics of it, or, the, uh, uh, or even the reaction, the resistance may be reactionary. We got the, the vanguard got to be consistent on always being to say, the, the, uh, this to be to put, we talk about Perkins said, heroin, the, 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 the various forms of plantation poison in our community, put in the context recognizing chemical biological warfare. The so-called music, these are propaganda bombs. When someone's locked up, you know, they're kidnapped. You know what I'm saying? Well, uh, well, uh, look, 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 look at the people are talking, people are easy, easy saying now, in case of um, um, uh, Rihanna uh, 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 Greer in Russia, even the most apolitical people are saying it's political. About her, about the, now, the, the, uh, the, um, 
deny your sentence. You know, you know what I'm saying? They, so we have to be able to grasp this and so on. And a lot of times people can, and this is a story, <laughs> where people can look, look across the country and see other places and see the political dynamics. But America is so Machiavellian with its tactics, people, you know, you can't even see the, the, the political nature of it. So we have to struggle to pick up and sum up the political dynamics of everything from a, from a prisoner to a new law. Thank you, Chairman Fred. And yeah, I really that really makes me just think about the culture component that General Dogon had spoken about earlier, along with uh, you know the education and the erasure that comes with that. And when you're talking about counterinsurgency, I'm I'm reminded of in the coalition we talk about community policing in that way as counterinsurgency, the presence of police within our communities. But in addition to that. Uh, these community policing bodies, like what we call CPABs, which are community police advisory boards, or the more recent CSACs, community safety advisory councils, where they take people from a community that they kind of seek out to control, typically black or brown people, and kind of utilize them to uh, give the illusion that the community has given consent to a community or to a police presence, um, and that really is a ratio of of harm and um, of the viewpoint of the generally subjugated larger population. Uh, and I think that highlights also the importance of self-determined black spaces that uh, Black Augusta uh, really cultivates. Um, I wanna open it up to questions or comments from uh, folks uh, in attendance today. If folks wanna raise their hands or you could even just drop it in the chat. Go ahead, Alan. Thank you, thank you all for this uh, very, uh, you know, critical and robust conversation, uh, Chairman Fred. I just want to go back to the uh, history of surveillance as well with you a little bit uh, more and, and dig a little deeper. Um, whereas a lot of uh, historically, uh, you know, a lot of focus is placed on the FBI and the NSA and and these intelligence agency, but the red squads have been before that, before even FBI was even in, you know, out there. So this goes back to the 1880s. And the significance of red squad was that they were started out of Chicago. And, uh, you know, just back in the 1880s after the Haymarket strike, uh, which was an eight hour workday strike. And then, you know, all of that kind of policing tactic um, and these uh, surveillance uh, units were exported all over the country. So, so that's one kind of thing too, that where local police has always been on the front lines of surveillance, spying and infiltration and, and the, the harm that they have caused. Now link that with what uh, Martius was just lifting and you're talking about counterinsurgency. I mean, I think from our perspective, all of policing is counterinsurgency. And, and the way they look at it is that all non-white non people, uh, particularly the black and indigenous communities are enemy combatants. So we have to we have to look at it, and I, I really do appreciate you lifting, uh, you know, this thing as well. That nah, this ain't a lockup; it's a kidnapping. I mean, it's it's a, let's just let's just call it what it is. Um, so dealing with enemy combatants, and now when you bring in the the uh, all of the material and all of the 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 weaponry that that goes on. Just today, this morning at the police commission, we were talking about this new state law, which has now codified and streamlined all the military equipment acquisition. So then the, the question becomes like, you know, this when you talk about a mine resistance ambush protected uh, vehicle, like what the F, what the fuck is that supposed to be, right? So, so I wanted to just, uh, you know, just uh, uh, have your thoughts on, you know, that, that lineage of history, and we can go further back to lantern laws 300 years ago um, in New York, but then particularly around this more organized infiltration and surveillance uh, that has been going on and how Chicago has been uh, on the forefront and you know, there's there's a lot to talk about, particularly the torture chambers in, in, in the prison and John Berg and all of those characters, you know, who were who were torturing people to to get false confessions out of people as well. But yeah, let's let's start with the Red Squads and that whole lineage and history of surveillance and spying and infiltration that you know continues on and how it links up with this whole uh, narrative of enemy combatant and counterinsurgency. Right on. You mentioned um, the um 
Lieutenant, um, Lieutenant John Burge, who um, at the Amnesty International, um, at the, at the, uh, they, one, of the, one of their headquarters is the House of, House of Screams. And uh, he had uh, one of his two main hotspots uh, was 39th in California and um, you know, uh, so, uh, Southeast side of Chicago, area two violent crimes. And Lieutenant John Burge was, you know, should, you know, should be defined as a you know, homegrown terrorist. In other words, he was, you know, he was, he was trained in Fort Bend in Georgia. Um, he was part of, uh, he was equipped with a, um, a lo like a, a local um, um, Navy SEAL, like an elite team. Uh, and, and some of his, uh, his hit men included, uh, included uh, individuals such as the infamous Joe Machine Gun Gorman, who gained his moniker, gained his nickname, of the role he played December the 4th, 1969, with the assassination of the Chairman for Aid and Defense Captain Mark Clark. Um, uh, Lieutenant John Burge, uh, his climax, if you will, um, occurred under the tenure of then state's attorney, then later become mayor, uh, Richard, da Richard, Richard, uh, Richard David Jr. Um, also, there was uh, also, Daly was a state's attorney, but there was a Negro police su superintendent, Lee, um, Leroy Martin. So I'm just trying to put things in context of the time, you know what I'm saying, like in Chicago, um, a major tactic that has been historically utilized that of neo-colonialism, you know, in, uh, 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 the role, you know, like even, it's, it's be, it was also noted on December 4, 1969, um, there were also Negro, Negro pigs that came, you know, came along with this, uh, on the assassination of James Gloves Davis in particular. But uh, you mentioned the Red Squad. Uh, one of the trumped up cases I was, I was issued, a uh, um, case in uh, 1991, in which the state had given me two Two cases, two trumped up cases of aggravated arson, in which they had claimed, um, I suppose, firebomb two two stores in the south side of Chicago, and which later said the motive was actually they said the state state the state had claimed that the motive was in response to the uh, verdict rendered in semi Valley by the LAPD beating the right uh, uh, beating the Rodney King, and uh, I was subsequently sentenced to uh, eighteen years. And well, I, during the time I was out on bond fighting that case, I was in Oakland and I was going through some of the old Black Panther Party newspapers. And lo and behold, the individual who I face and name I recognize, um, a, 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 who was on my case, Sergeant Joseph P. Grubasek. And Grubasek stuck out in, in, uh, at the police, uh, at, uh, police headquarters and I was locked up for this case. There were various um, law enforcement agencies that, that came together to give me the case, and I, it was kind of mind-boggling how this individual was, was CPD. He was Chicago Police Department. How was he calling the shots? How was he directing the different agencies? You know what I'm saying? And um, uh, at the police, at the there was debate on who's going to charge me. But he, he seemed to be pulling some strings. When I seen this picture in an uh, old edition of Black Panther Party newspaper, Sergeant Joseph P. Grubasek. He was, he was actually a member of the uh, Red Squad, also um, the Legion of Justice, and, and uh, was directly involved in um, on, uh, surveillance, and subsequent assassination of uh, Chairman Fred Hampton. Um, and he, um, later on, did, when I was not uh, trying to bring this contradiction out, um, when I was here captain in my appeal process, Pushed his name in particular, all of a sudden they say he just uh, he just he passed away. It was, it was a small note in the obituary section in uh, um, the Chicago Sun Times, and um, that, that that was one of the tactics, the, the, the moves with the case that I was locked up to expose the ongoing and continuing counterinsurgency. Because many people are in the impression that you know with the uh, physical death, you know with the death of Jack Hoover, that it did some you know saying that uh, this this is a bad apple. Uh, the police tactics, you know, saying they, 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 they know they're going to, you know, hold, you know, stop doing what they're doing. But the deal is, um, they engage in protracted attacks, you know, so our movements, and our people in general. Um, but uh, again, um, as you point out, um, the, Red, the history of the Red Squad goes goes way back. Even um, the role they play in infamous black sites that were exposed here in Chicago, that you know, that um, I guess it's a step up to even for them to be acknowledged as, as black sites. Cause uh, we, uh, I remember as a youngster growing up, we would, we were, there were references, um, uh, whoopee stations 
where people just be taken to these police stations, you know, so you see whoop, you know, uh, when, when uh, um, take to these police stations where, where no, 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 um, there was even, it was not even a facade that your constitutional rights were being honored, you know what I'm saying? No, no, no phone calls, no nothing. And, um, a white individual was taken to, to the, to the, to the, to the uh, black sites. That's really helped heighten contradiction. People say, wait a minute, we have a problem here. But the Red Squad's involvement, in all, even to this day, the black sites still, still exist here in Chicago and I'm sure other places. Thank you, Chairman Fred. General, I see your hand up. Give me one second, y'all. Yes. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Uh, I just wanted to just say that who do people think the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines, uh, the CIA, the FBI, all these local police, who is all that and all this equipment and weapons? Who we think all that shit is for? Right? You know, who they working for? Right? They working for the same people the slave catchers was working for, right? Mr. Gilmore, right? Um, the white right, right? Uh, uh, public safety, public safety for who? You know, protect and to serve, serve who? You know, uh, this country has long declared war on people of color. You know, uh, we got a sleeping giant going on. We need to wake up. You know, because the people are under attack. And what do we do? We fight back. And so that's what this is all about. You know, it's about education, sharing knowledge, right? But it's also about getting involved. You know, that's the message for the night. You know, just like I was saying, if you ain't a part of something, get a part of something. You know, join the, the Pigs Coalition, stop the Pigs Coalition. You know, join LA Can, you know, join Street Watch. Because when you join any one of us, join us all, you join the movement. Right, you join the fight, and that's what it's all about, right? Uh, this Friday, like I was saying, we have a uh, uh, we're gonna be continuing this uh, Black August conversation, and we're gonna be talking about more on the ground, organizing it with the work, you know. Uh, and uh, I want to give a shout out an invite to stop the peace coalition to have a couple words there as well, and so so that's what it's about, right? It's about you know, uh, Black August telling the story, sitting down, right? And, and at the same time, creating plans to fight back. Right? And so uh, I'm gonna stop right there. Thank you. Yes, man, thank you, General Dogon. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm so pleased you named all those agencies. and. Now, you know, we, we kind of shined a little more light, especially at the coalition, we talked about the information sharing environment and how these different agencies work together. But Chairman Fred, I, I think even considering that they use the 92 rebellion to, uh, uh, you know, target you politically, is so telling of the fact that this is a concerted effort. I mean, it sounds ludicrous on its face, the fact that an event, you know, in another city would, uh, would be something that's leveraged to lock you up, but they really are working together. Um, so earlier we'd been talking about uh, erasure and um, Natalie was talking about the, the work that the No Name Book Club does, uh, sending literature and information to uh, incarcerated um, uh, folks. And Natalie, I was wondering if you can maybe talk about, um, you know, in that effort, in that um, pursuit of cultivating culture within incarcerated spaces, what are some run-ins you've kind of experienced uh, with the same kind of erasure, specifically censorship? Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. I think um, we just want to repeat and like remind folks that when folks are being sent to prisons or uh, jails, etc., they are meant to be disappeared. We're not meant to acknowledge them, and they're also not supposed to have rights, right? So we have, uh, which you know, totally not okay. Um, but there's, uh, you know, there's most of the books, if not all the books we send in have um, follow the black radical tradition. They're um, not always political books specifically. Like it's not like the, you know, guerrilla, guerrilla warfare or something like that. It can be a novel, but oftentimes the, the different facilities 
force, um, force, well, force people not to receive their literature, right? They force them not to get their stuff. They uh, censor the material. They also um, receive them as contraband. And then they'll send us a letter like, hey, here's, here's, you know, we're not gonna take this book because it could incite violence, which is about the laziest thing ever because it's such a vague statement. Anything could incite violence. Um, so I'm not the uh, prison program coordinator. I just wanted to uplift that Sage is our prison program coordinator. They're not on this call right now. Um, but they, they've been doing this work of tracking and tracing who is receiving their books and who's not. And, um, and it's pretty bad, it's pretty bleak. And Lorenzo Combo Urban, who I mentioned earlier, has been trying to launch a censorship campaign uh, just to bring light to the fact that they're just flat out banning books. So yes, they're banning outside. We're talking about Toni Morrison and we're talking about 1619 Project being banned for us in, like, in communities and in schools. But this list of banned books is much more expansive than facilities, and it's really, really hard to track sometimes. Um, so we don't have a we don't have a, 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 a website or a contact that we can gear folks if they're interested in getting connected to that. But we are working on it on an anti censorship campaign. So if folks, I'm actually going to drop in my email in the chat if folks do want to get connected to that. Um, because yeah, we're just seeing it getting worse and worse. And a couple of months ago we had, we were reading live from death row uh, from Muni Abu Jamal. And one thing that we just kind of kept repeating to folks, like he really fought for this, right? For his like freedom to like continue his journalism and to do research and to communicate with people because that's kind of the, the trap about incarcerating folks and disappearing them. is that you're also trying to take away their, their livelihoods, their, um, their means of communicating with people and us, uh, from being advocates to them. So uh, I just want to urge people, yes, absolutely, please do get involved more in groups like LA Can, Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, folks that are working with the unhoused community um, and advocates with along with them. And also please find time to uh, do some like Books Through Bars program advocacy work for uh, incarcerated people because like these are two major groups of people who are meant to be disappeared who are meant to be seen less than and who we are and who we are encouraged to as a like general consensus to speak poorly about right because what's what's really hard when you're trying to say like hey i deserve this human right is when someone's like well you fucked up and you're in prison so you don't get no rights like that's like what and we we hear the same language being said about um and house people where it's like, well, it's because they did this or that or whatever. It's really horrible. I mean, like, you know, not only should we not normalize it, but we should be finding ways to plug in and connect because it's, you know, when we're talking about the vanguard, we do have to include all the folks who are most uh, oppressed and marginalized. Um, yeah, I think I went on the, uh, I was going off of General Dogon's energy, like, yeah, let's get out in the streets. And I'm like, yeah, get out there. <laughs> um, but yeah, here's my email. Please feel free to reach out if you'd like to get connected with some more of the um, censorship campaign information, which we should be rolling out pretty soon in the next couple of months. Thank you so much, Natalie. I got some of that energy too. Um, and yeah, once again, I just want to open it up for folks. If anybody has any questions or comments. Uh, Take it away, Adam. Hey, free them all, Chairman. Thanks again for doing this. Free them all, Correct, right on. Hey, so, uh, you know, I, I would love to hear uh, what you had to say about the FBI uh, hitting Chairman O'Malley. Uh, and uh, I mean, because I know you've been through, I, it, it's, I've heard you tell the story before of, of your time in the concentration camp. You know, um, and uh, and and yeah, uh, yeah. Please, uh, if if you could elucidate on that, that that I would, because I mean, uh, you, well, go go ahead, Chair. Take it away. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, uh, actually, I'm just getting hip to some. Uh, I'm not, I'm not abreast all the details. Um, if it was just in uh, Saint, so yeah, you may you may get bring you know what I'm saying. Pete, uh, fill me in. Saint Louis is um uh. Was it, it, it jumped on, on, on his home? It, it was in Saint 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 Louis. So you might get to fill me in uh, details, uh, Adam, on that. Adam. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, but, I mean, so the 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 feds, uh, yeah, they 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 attacked, they they uh, yanked him out of his home, and it, it's not just him. The the entire uh, uh, African People's Party and like the entire leadership structure and uh, uh, are you know 
our elders and, and, and wise people in the movement, you know, and they, they, they show up to Trump's, uh, to, to, to Trump's house with a warrant and say, can we please search? They show up to, to our elders and, and point guns at them and yank them out of their house. You know, uh, yeah. it's apparently yeah. over, uh, over contact, uh, char- they're attempting to charge them with conspiracy uh, for supporting some Russian. It, 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 it's, it's a weird thing. But I, what I was hoping more is what you could go into is, uh, is, is your time uh, in those concentration camps. And I, I remember the story of how they were transferring you between cell blocks and, uh, and different things like that and how uh, the, those, uh, those teachings helped help center you up and sort of helped uh, get you to the place where you was and, and push you through. Like, uh, yeah, if you could do that. Well, okay, well, you know, um, I guess the, you know, the, the earlier part, you know, since, I mean, this is the history, how they, you know, uh, you doing? Uh, you know how they get out? You know, move. Um, uh, as far as even any constitutional rights, as Minister U.P. News said, you know, what I'm saying uh, when the constitution uh, uh, applied to black people, it's, it's, it's nothing more than, as he said, you know, uh, pagan poetry. You know, what I'm saying so. Even due process, all that. You know, what I'm saying you know, how they, you know, historically, you know, uh, 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 that, that lot, you know, you, you said the whole procedure going to Trump's house. You know, to uh, say they, you know. Uh, uh, you, uh, the, 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 the way the way they did it in contrast, you see, you know, what I'm saying, you see, uh, had he talked to Channel Molly, on Molly's as a whole, I mean, the basic race, the race contradiction alone, you know, what I'm saying, but again, uh, we're talking about due process, so and so forth. Again, Miss <laughs> European says it's pagan poetry. Um, Father Matai held captive, you know, uh, as Miss uh, European said, prisons a microcosm outside community. So, that, you know, um, somebody just commented the other day to me, say. I thought um, the uh, circuit was uh, outlawed. Uh, excuse me, uh, the circuit uh, was was illegal, and that's where they arbitrarily transfer you from one place to another. You know, so what they do it, you know, saying so, uh, state, the state knows the power to words and terms. When they come in and say, uh, "Okay, you know, well, you're not on the circuit anymore. You, you'll be uh, you're being transferred." So you know, what I'm saying so. So even we like kind of go back to our, uh, uh, something we mentioned earlier. By even the, the uh, body cams, you got uh, even the, the, the laws when, you, when they come through. You know, when we hide these contradictions, or the, or the state says something is bogus, or you know, whether it be the, the, the being on circuit or they got wear body cams. We got we, we got to always we got to uh, uh, remain remain mindful that you know what I'm saying again that uh, the narrative of how the, the videos do in the editing process the the, the terms that they just they say okay you write this 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 is illegal that's this, this you know uh, apply another euphemism to it so we get, you know, everything's political including laws you know what I'm saying term of prison you know what I'm saying it's, it's not about rehabilitation so we get, so we got to be able to not so to, even when these different concessions come not get caught up you know so biting the apple of reform but also you know so holding 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 steadfast as France Fanon said you know, to be able to accept the concession of never compromise our principles. Our principles got to be that of self-determination, you know, hold the line. That was absolutely beautiful, Chairman Fred. Don't bite the apple of beef on. Um, I want to I pass it to you. Get your hand up. General Dogon. Hey, what's up? Oh, you had your hand up, General. I thought maybe you, you had something. Oh, to say. no, no, I was lowering it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, I also want to shout out Brother Pancake, another LA Can organizer, housing rights organizer on the call. Um, see if you had anything to add. Um, maybe you can unmute and chime in. But in the meantime, Chairman Fred, so earlier General Dogon talked to us about how you know, while incarcerated, Black August was a means for folks to kind of come together and uh, conduct communal study uh, and come together and share information about Black history. I'm wondering, A, what that looked like for you, but also what is the broader importance of Black August, specifically that month uh, for you? You know, definitely, um, uh, being you know, in uh, such a uh, particular Black Panther Party, because you, you'll hear us in the change we use BPPC, but also POCC, the term Presidents of Conscious Committee. Um, 
But you said we're not a prison activist organization, we're a revolutionary organization. However, we um we we, we were birthed we were birthed behind enemy lines. Um and um you know, our match one of our matches being free them all, you know what I'm saying, is not limited to just that of those who are here captives. In fact, we draw the correlation, you know what I'm saying, to our, you know, our to, to the outside community, our people in general. Um but however the intensified attacks that are going on behind the walls and, 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 and the need for resistance. In fact, we have the one prisoner, one contact campaign, which means basically at any given time, everyone should really give us a status check on some respect to, you know, prisoner, you know, say if they're alive or not, you know, say, you know, who's here, so on and so forth. But really taking note and, you know, saying shine light, you know, saying of, 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 of their resistance. Uh, the, the attacks and the resistance just happen, you know, saying behind, behind, behind enemy lines. I mean, we see again the arrogance, how the state centuries, how they move around, you know, how they move, knowing they have body cams on. You know what I'm saying? So you you want you, you only imagine, better you can imagine what's going down behind enemy lines. Um, you draw speak up, get an example or analogy, how some initial victims in the gas chamber in Nazi Germany with um uh, Adolf Hitler study who didn't receive any mail. He studied that. There are prisons in Illinois who have been dead over excess of 15 years, but the state still receives uh, resources, they still on count because you know, no accountability. So go back to the heart of your question, you know, it's really shining light, you know what I'm saying, on, 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 the, on the attacks and you know what I'm saying, uh, and the uh, need for resistance. And we know, you know what I'm saying, you're limited, you know what I'm saying, behind those walls. Um, but however, uh, there, are, there are resources that we cannot, we, cannot, we cannot even afford to just dismiss, you know, in fact, I think one of the first initial moves that Saddam Hussein had did when the U.S. declared to make their move on Iraq, he said, "Open those prison doors." You know, and there's so much, there's so many assets that we, the geniuses, you know, what I'm saying uh, that that are held captive. You know, what I'm saying uh, they they've done in many in many cases in our community, similar to what was known in Africa as the brain drain. They take some of our best resources and talents. You know, what I'm saying and, and, and they, they, uh, they take they, they hold them captive. So you know what I'm saying. So again, we really got to shine light on, on um, in particular, in this, this 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 period of time um, to those who are here captive and recognize the need. You know what I'm saying, and also for the support, outside support, because um, long held and recent released political prisoner Sunday Ali Coley had uh, um, assessed some of the differences, contrast about the uprisings that occurred when former U.S. President Bill Clinton had refused to rescind the disproportionate sentences with the crack cocaine as opposed to powder cocaine. There were uprisings throughout the concentration camps in the country. However, it did not have that same sentiment, that same connection to the outside community, that connection that we've seen, that climate during the Black Power Movement, where, you know, um, uh, you, uh, uh, during the Attica, uh, uh, Solidad, Pontiac 17, it was, a, it was a connection, it was a climate where, uh, children would say, my, my, fa my father is locked up or uh, uh, my mother is on the run, as opposed to later on due to the state's propaganda, people say, I don't have a father, I don't have a mother, so on and so forth. Uh, it was a climate that people related to the sentiments of the William and Thoreau, uh, uh, who are the civil disobedience, where you say the people say, well, in an unjust society, the only just place for a just man, I'm paraphrasing, a just man or a just woman was prison. So it was a different, it was a climate where the black, uh, when the Sada Shakur was, was on, on the lamb, on the run, there was scorched earth. And people said, Asada, you're welcome, to come, you're welcome to come here. So even how we view that, you know what I'm saying? And, and again, that connection, that correlation to those held captive, uh, in particular, this, this, this time, got to be stressed. Free them all. Mm -hmm. I might have to... Uh, We lost you for a second there, Chairman Fred, but. Um... Yeah, I just want to say that, that, no, that was, thank you for saying that. And that I think highlighting how important that language is, even uh, elucidating between my father is locked up and I don't have a father, speaks to that erasure that you know, was talking about that these prisons try to do. But Chairman Fred, I think you're about to say something else. I didn't mean to cut you off. You are you're muted, Chairman. 
Chairman Fred, I'm so sorry, you're muted over there. Oh, for all, I was saying, I said, forgive me. I might, I might get, I, might, I, 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 I have to make a move. Um, I'm gonna try to tap back in. I don't know how much longer y'all get, but I gotta address something else too. What time is it? Yeah, uh, I can, I can do one, more, one or two more questions. Hold on one second. Who? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be here. We're grateful for your time, and uh, we, we want to make sure you have the time to also plug folks in. Uh, we've posted about the event on the 27th on our uh, IG and Twitter page, so we can plug that. But do folks have? A couple more questions for Chairman Fred while we have him. You've been so generous with your time. Thank you. Well, you stay here, you. Okay. Well, Chairman, just once again, before you go, could you break down uh, uh, the schedule for the streets party if people do want to participate? I mean, uh, it's coming up in two weeks and flights is uh, cheap if you book them now. All right, let's do that. And then we've got a question from Matthew Vickers, if we can squeeze him in. Uh, Hello, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Matthew. Yeah. Um, so this is mostly about what you said just earlier. And I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, sort of the dialectic between those incarcerated and non incarcerated. And since sort of the 2020 protest, this has been like a question that I've been sort of looking for answers for. Um, for people who are separated from people who aren't affected by the carceral state, what is sort of like the best means? and means to persuasion to recognize the, the dignity and fight for the, the rights of the oppressed? It's a, it's a very sort of general question, but I'll be very interested in hearing your answer. I mean, you know, um, everything, 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 is, everything is political, including you know, our words, our terms, how we, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's something that we can't we can't afford the luxury to have a, you know uh, have a reactionary response to. In other words, just you know pick and choose or piecemeal when we choose to be political. You know, you know what I'm saying? We, I mean, we have to be consistent. You know what I'm saying? You know, in other words, you know, so, you know sometimes we get caught with our emotions. We just say, well, even even those who are held captive. I remember struggles I would have with you know fellow captives. But, but yeah, man, I, you know, I didn't do this. They framed me for this. But you know what I'm saying? But I was I, I did something before in my life. I deserve to be locked up. So. I mean, as a, I mean, it's and also putting this. In, in, I mean, having an objective assessment of this. I mean, the purpose again, the purpose of prisons. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the whole. I mean, if this if this was about stopping crime, you know, I mean, you have Bush and the rest of these gangsters buried up under the penitentiary. You know what I'm saying? And if anyone believes that the police or any state entity is 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 is, is, uh, is the um, is, is the purpose of this is to stop crime, you believe Don King want to stop boxing? You know what I'm saying? And so, I mean, and, and not even. You know, check our emotions. Our emotions check us. You know, what I'm saying, so, you know, you know, we right in the city of Chicago, which is infamous, referred to as Chirac. Well, you know, what I'm saying you 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 know you, you get bombarded with this propaganda like black on black crime. You know, what I'm saying you don't you don't you know, that people can't see the state's hand. And you know, what I'm saying creating these conditions. You know, what I'm saying doing. I mean, actually doing the actual killing this, this, themselves. And it's, 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 so you, have, you know, what I'm saying you, it's, you have an emotional reaction and response. But the whole line, I'm just you know historical analysis and, and uh, um. Uh, the, the, again, be consistent. Um, to put this in context. I say we, even the terms bond and uh, 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 is ransoms, and you know, so, you know, heighten the contradictions. Cook County Jail is down the street from the Humane Society. If there, if there was that many, if there were dogs and cats, I had, you know, if this was happening to those animals, you know, there'd be uproar. So you know, so, again, we have to check our emotions. Our emotions check us. You know, what I'm saying be consistent with this. You know, not, you know, not, you know people. They, they, they beat us down to the point that we look for the the root. We, you know, Chairman Fred would say we would call, you know, call, call him Frank James, stop with Jesse James, it's done. So we have to hold the line. And I, you know, it, it even, it's, 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 um, it's just plain gold. I'm literally, I'm literally, you know, and, and, and I just, this ain't, this is not something that people just can read about. Just, you know, saying, you know, I mean, I want to show you out on the movie set. They, they would try to quote these bogus books. You know, what I'm saying they would say, "Well, this person said that." I said, "Listen, theory and practice. 
theory and practice. You know, I'm right here. Well, I'm sitting there right now. Literally, well, I'm sitting there right now. This is exactly what it, this is exactly the same spot where Chairman Fred was given a case where they said he's supposed to send one out of ice cream and get uh, from a good human ice cream truck gave it to the children. Right here, where I'm standing there right now. And the other individual came and said he did it. The state said, "No, we want Chairman Fred." He was sent, Chairman Fred was sent to state for your prison. At that time, they would call you by your prison number, not by your name. If he responded, his only response was, I am Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton, Illinois Chapter Chairman of the Black Panther Party. And they had deemed him to be criminally mentally insane for refusing to answer to the number. The stance he took, he'd done it in an objective way. Similar to the way the Minister UEP Newton challenged, challenged the whole conditions, uh, uh, not in a subjective about him, but putting the context for the people to change the conditions in the whole. So it, 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 uh, as Chairman Fred did, about uh, uh, how he had to be re uh, referred, reference, it changed the conditions where the prison administration had to call you by your last name as opposed to your number. So with the fight, we have to deal, we have to hide these contradictions, and deal with these contradictions objectively. Um, that also the question Adam had asked, we're gonna be, everybody gonna say, yeah, come on, come on this way, y'all, August 30th for the Chairman Fred's Street Party. Gonna be, gonna say, gonna be right, gonna, we're going to ground zero, one of the ground zeros. He, him and the defense got a Mark Clark were assassinated at 12 o'clock, August 30th. You go to Chairman Fred Street's party dot, uh, dot com, say the house dot org, and, and, and get all the details. But uh, we're moving forward to uh, August 30th. Y'all see me right, right here? I'm outside the Hampton House right now. You know, so we get, we're gearing up for August 30th. Chairman Fred, thank you so much. I'm going to drop the link to that Instagram post. It's the second slide, but also the website where folks can donate to the street party as well. I encourage folks to do so. Um, thank you so much. Again, it's such an honor to have you here with us. Thank you for sharing space. I know I've learned a lot. I'm sure that's the case for everybody else here. We appreciate you. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate the people. I'm, uh, I'm honored and humbled to serve. Thank you. And I also need a shout out Adam Rice for facilitating this um, incredible organizer here in LA. Uh, so thank you for setting right up. Right on. Okay. All right, come on. Free them all. Pals of people. Free them all, Chair. Free them all. Please. Can I just add to something that um, Chairman Fred just said? Uh, everything is political. I just, I'd love, I love hearing that. I can hear that 20 times a day. I can hear it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? Like everything you do, everything that you organize around, or even if it feels like super small, is political. Like just thinking, and I'm embarrassed that I don't remember their names, but like all the cafeteria workers that organized during the, um, Montgomery, uh, the the bus strike, sorry. And, you know, even as, you know, the ice cream, like taking the ice cream, giving it to the kids and being like told like, oh, you're gonna make a 40 years in prison or some shit for that. Like literally everything we do is political. And um, uh, even just like reflecting on like the reversal of Roe v. Wade recently, there was a lot of despair and it's like, cool, let's, let's talk about where we can plug in, right? Like where are the women's prisons that are going to be most affected by this? Are you able to um, facilitate, like, lead, take on a training for like doula services, et cetera? Like, there's so many ways, and you don't have to go to the one thing that is like super cool right now, but you can definitely see where your interests are and like think, like, you know, deeply analyze that and think, where can I plug in in this, in this one particular thing? Um, yeah, I love that. I love that phrase so much. Um, this is why we consider all prisoners, political prisoners, because we shouldn't have these institutions to begin with. Um, who cares like about the respectability thing like, oh, but they did. No, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's not, these systems should not be in place at all. And they dehumanize us and everyone that participates in them. So um, yeah, just to like really reiterate, everything's political. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Natalie. I, I wanna open it up for folks to make any comments or questions, reflect on anything you've just heard. Yeah. And you know, we talked about, um, you know, we, we've had a few people uh, share here. I'm about to put someone on the spot. Uh, and I, I hope this isn't, uh, uh, you know, too bad, but we've got an incredible, uh, academic organizer DHA on the call. Uh, I, I'm wondering, you know, how how you reflect on Black August, all its components, specifically the study component, um, especially you know you, you've been called a hood scholar before, and just yeah, how, how this kind of resonates with you this entire conversation. Uh, uh, 
Yes. Thanks. <laughs> now, this is incredible. And shout out to Adam and General Dogon and everyone with Stop LAPD Spying. And it's just incredible being part of this work. And I think what he, what Chairman Fred Hampton uh, <laughs> Jr. said about Biden the Apple reform, and it got that kind of got my gears going with how we've been kind of trying to challenge this conversation around like what is a a, a transformative reform and non-reformist reform um and lately I've just been thinking because of last week with Black August how much of the radical history of of Black liberation is or to some degree is being sanitized out of ongoing and contemporary forms of um of not just like abolition but within the nonprofit industrial complex that is all of what is social justice work today um and really trying to eradicate anti-blackness and look at the seat of um black radical liberation as um, what the work that in the ends of the work that we need to be doing. Um, and so I've just been, I mean, of course, in like a scholarly realm and some to some degree in activist like circles, and I think in particular in LA, like I think that history is 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 foundational to the work. But I do think that something with um for me, the 2020 George Floyd protests may have not like taken people back to that and I think what Chairman Fred Hampton mentioned about this sort of he mentioned like a elementary like um uh clue into these kind of dynamics and I think again the the knowledge building and the connections that are continuously being made through Stop LAPD Spine the conversations that we're having where people can easily plug in and also support um, on the ground work is incredible and is tapping into a broader, the broader movement work happening in LA. So just shout out again, this space is amazing <laughs> as always. And um, thanks for calling me out. Um, and I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you for being so gracious and for always providing such a wealth of knowledge. We, know we appreciate you. Um, yeah, anybody else? Any other comments or questions? Does anybody want to reflect on everything we've heard? I know it's a lot. Yeah, that's a great question from Natalie in the chat. Uh, always curious what's on people's Black August reading list. Does anyone want to share? You know, I'll, I'll go first. I've been reading this with a buddy of mine and I'm behind, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm reading uh, 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 How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, by Walter Rodney, which is an essential read, but that's what I've got going on. Well, if you're ever looking for something to read, I'm sure No Name Book Club has a, a pretty long list. Natalie, what are you reading? I am reading the next several months of book club picks uh, that we are thinking through. So actually very little time for, um, but actually Sophia Bukhari's um, War, War Next Door. I'll look, I'll look, I'll grab the book. Um, I actually just finished rereading it. Um, I really wish we knew we got a chance to like learn more and experience more of her through her like uh, Black Panther Party organizing. Um, 
Yeah, she's really special. I mean, she does have some moments that she could have uh, hopefully redeemed herself. And they mentioned that, um, but yeah, I'm gonna grab the book and show it to y'all. Yeah, cool. Well, Natalie grabs that. Uh, we can, we've got Steve in the chat with uh, Oliver Cromwell Cox, cast, class, and race. Sick. Then we got Adam Rice with uh, Foreman's Making Black Revolutionaries. Throw that book up, Natalie. I think you're about to. Oh, I love these. We Will Return um, in the Whirlwind is such an excellent, like, capsule, like, um, book on like all the different like black movements of before. We actually just send a bunch of those out to our um, folks. So we'd love to hear what you think of it, Shakir. Awesome. And he's got love with accountability. And I'm sure most, if not all of these books are available at the No Name Book Club. So Y'all should roll through. It's a great place to study, a great place to read. Um, yeah. If there are no more thoughts or reflections, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm already employed. <laughs> so, and uh, I, I love where I work. Uh, no questions there. <laughs> um, no, I do. Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe we can uh, talk about updates. Um, me or Hamid, I don't know if either of you want to talk about the police commission meeting today. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can kick us off. Um, so just uh, uh, um, yeah, some updates about some of the the programming, some of the stuff that we're going to be uh, having in place. So uh, this is the third uh, third week of the month. Um, so it's it's centered on the general uh, meeting, and then next month we'll have on Tuesday. Um, Every week we have uh, webinars and the fourth uh, Tuesday is going to be dedicated um, on data driven policing and we're going to be looking and, and uh, giving folks a sneak uh, preview of, a, of a, the uprising and reform zine that we've been working on in our uh, community policing working group, um, just talking about um, the uh, Watts, the uh, Rodney King and George Floyd and the um, after these um, like massive uh, people led movements, um, how the state comes and introduces a bunch of reform efforts and, and the ways in which it um, both it co-ops the, the language. Um, so we're seeing a lot of, um, even today in police commission, um, a lot of uh, them utilizing things like mutual aid and um, things that, that have uh, like are political or things that are created because of what the state has um, historically has looted and, and um, like the, the lack of resources that a lot of our communities um, have historically uh, felt. And so, um, yeah, it, it talks a little bit about that kind of that history and, and um, the, the ways in which that's kind of uh, forms of, of, it shows forms of abuse um, and the ways that we're kind of, we're consistently gaslit, consistently, um, being told that like they're gonna make some reforms, but we know that like as as kind of history has taught us, like those reforms, whether it's body cameras, whether it's trainings, whether it's hiring more diverse or diverse cops, um, how that's uh, not getting to the root of of what folks are saying as far as like that that policing and the police state is um, the the intent is to cause harm. Um, even just looking at that history. And so um, next week we'll be having that sneak peek um, and it's on Tuesday uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and then I'm not sure um, and if um, you want to spot, maybe talk a little bit more about the police commission, but we did have um, a few things that we uh, we released a toolkit um, as well, just uh, mobilizing and letting folks in the community aware of the, the different um, programs and, and policies that LAPD is, is um, introducing, uh, reintroducing and, and just renaming, um, including the military, um, AB 481, and um, the the wish list or the the, the list of um, equipment um, that, uh, military equipment that they are proposing. And um, it includes a lot of things from microwave, um, LRADs, um, Humphreys, um, a bunch of different technology, um, as folks had mentioned here about like, who is this uh, military weapon and, um, 
expanding uh, weapons that LAPD has a hands on, um, who is it going to target and who is it going to be used on? Um, because we know, um, as we've seen with some of the with the uprisings, how this technology is utilized um, as well. Yeah, no, thank you, Nina. That's uh, that's uh, that's a really good point because a lot of times uh, when we think of electronic warfare. Uh, you know, we uh, think of, uh, you know, just uh, freezing up uh, the, the electronic systems and, you know, just defense systems or offensive weaponry and this, that and the other. But the microwave weapons uh, have been a part of uh, waging war for the longest time. And, uh, you know, how they impact people's brain, uh, uh, how they impact people's other physiology. Um, and of course, uh, you know, just folks living on the street would be the first ones to talk, tell you that that is a constant. That is like, you know, it's and it's not only high, high powered cables overhead or utility cables or other things, but now with these, uh, with these, and, and especially looking at Skid Row and the way the infrastructure of Skid Row is set up, um, you know, with, which is completely hardly there is no green space or anything like that but what you have is these boxes that surround you constantly and these boxes and clusters of uh, of uh, of uh, instrumentation and various forms of telecommunication systems which emit all these rays and and radio wave uh, waves and everything else, which are extremely, extremely harmful to people's bodies. Um, you know, and, and when you when you look at and now the the expansion of five G uh, networks as well, and where the distance between poles and where these antennas are being installed, the impact that they're going to be having. So on top of that, now the LAPD wants to have microwave weaponry in their arsenal as well. But I think I also want to touch quickly on on another very, very significant uh, uh, action that happened. To Today and we were talking about um, and Dejane lifted it up too, just biting the apple of the reform. That you know this was a fight that the coalition has been fighting back for at least since it, since it was first revealed in 2015, and this was a model uh, of an ordinance that the ACLU had crafted, which basically would be a reform, which is about this language of transparency and accountability. Um, and reporting and everything else on surveillance technologies and surveillance equipment. Um, well, um, we fought back and we were able to shut that down. And to the extent that the ACLU themselves finally saw the light, at least in SoCal, and, and, and listened to the folks on the street. And in November of last year, they sent a pretty strong letter to the police commission saying, yo, we completely are opposed to you using our, our framework. But what does the LAPD do? They they basically in this in light of uh, post or, or or I don't even know why we use the word post post George Floyd because it's a continuing uh, struggle and violence that goes on. But during those days, the after action implementation plan LAPC came up with a proposal to to institute a uh, set up a whole oversight policy over surveillance technology and information technology. Now they know that nobody in LA is going to support that. I mean, and they we even sent them a letter signed by over 25 different organizations, uh, you know, including people who have worked with the LAPD in the past as well, right? So, but what do they do? They go to Oakland and they bring somebody from Oakland and import a community member as a community voice. And who also happens to be an activist, who also happens to be a, an advocate. His name is Brian Hofer. Uh, and his group is called Secure Justice. And when so when we looked through the emails, because we have, we had filed for public records and got the emails, it is it is the most pathetic thing that you will ever see. Um, that um, the the commander of the the Information Technology Bureau sends him an email that we would like to invite you to be a part of the working group. And within eleven minutes, he responds like, "Yep, I'm there." Now you would have thought that somebody living in Oakland would at least, and somebody who knows people here, like we, I remember that we worked with him in our 2014 action when we shut down the Fusion Center in LA, right? So this was a multi-city action we had organized and he was there uh, basically one of the, the main organizers in the Bay Area, but never consulted anybody, never even told to anybody what he's doing. Uh, Shakir and I were on a phone call with him as well, and he completely stayed mum. And he and we found out through their um, uh, LAPD's uh, uh, report that, and then when we saw him on the screen, we were like, what the fuck? I mean, this, this dude was talking to us just about a couple of months ago. 
And even more ironic was that here he is proposing the LAPD to use this ACLU model. But a couple of weeks before that, he is suing the city of Oakland for having used that model that he had pushed for, saying that it doesn't work. So that's the kind of, I would say, fuckery that we, we are constantly dealing with, um, you know, that in, in the system. And then, of course, you know, just uh, uh, and then and, and then it was another email that we saw was and I'm sorry, I'm taking too much time. I'll end there that where um, the, the assistant commander of information technology reaches out to him and he says, hey, the chief is saying that when you present these things to the, to the commission team, you have to have community present. So now the commander is saying, where the fuck do I get the community in LA? Nobody is here. So he writes to, he writes to Hofer that I have checked with my commander and I have checked with T. Fank, who is the executive director of the police commission, that you will bring in the community perspective. So now things that are going to impact LA are being community perspective is being provided by an organizer or an advocate uh, out of Oakland. So I just, just wanted to share this model that to what extent and what length, you know, they will go and they will go um, where, you know, and then they will come back and this is the most tight and the more in depth anyway. So I just wanted to share that, that this, the, the fight continues. Um, you know, I mean, for us, we're constantly suited up. I mean, you know, we cannot just, uh, you know, just not be. And uh, it's not just always political. It is just, uh, which it is, that we are at a 24-7 war. So, you know, that's where at least uh, the way we look at it and we're thinking about that. Thank you, Hamid. Um, and that makes me think about what Chairman Fred was saying about uh, you know, the narratives they craft and even just the erasure of the community because you know, like Hamid was saying, we had a letter with over two dozen orgs who you know, deal with the most impacted groups around police violence. And they said, no one wanted this, but uh, they chose to elevate someone aligned with what they wanted uh, to be the community that's counterinsurgency. Any other thoughts or questions about any of that? Or Shakir, if there's anything you wanted to add? Are you good? Cool. I'm just gonna add one last thing. I'm gonna put on the chat real quick um, a link um, to our stoplapdspine.org, our website. Um, so if folks are interested or would want to plug into any of our working groups um, or even just know what kind of workshops or things that we're gonna be doing, um, the link to the link on the chat just uh, provides you a calendar invite, uh, which will provide you either the Zoom link or just the information about some workshops that we're hosting, um, both upcoming and in, in the future. Thanks, me. And if you're feeling FOMO about Chairman, uh, you know, Ch Chairman Fred Hampton Street Party in Chicago, uh, Chico's Justice is holding a martyrs tour on Saturday, August 27th at 10 a.m. Um, folks should, I don't think there's a flyer out for that yet, but folks should tune into uh, Youth Justice Coalition's Instagram page and also the Black August Los Angeles Instagram page and they'll have more details up there. Um, yeah, join our working group, email us at stoplapdspying at gmail.com. Follow us on our socials to plug in with any more stuff um, and sign up for our MailChimp if you haven't already. Um, if there aren't any other announcements, I think that's it, folks. Natalie, thank you so, so much for plugging in. General Dogon, always a pleasure. I'm so lucky to have you both. Thank you all so much. Thank you um, for having us and for this conversation in this space, y'all. Till next time. Appreciate you. Yep, thank you. Looking forward to the follow-up. Appreciate it. Power to the people. That was great. How many are you going to stop recording? Or? Actually, let me get some of that praise on, on the record there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice facilitation, Montes. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks. All right.